Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome back to the Cyber Underground. I'm Dave the Cyber Guy. This is the Cyber Underground. I'm your host, Dave Stevens. I teach with the University of Hawaii Kapiolani Community College. I teach uh, ethical hacking and IT, and I'm here with our guest from the UH System, University of Hawaii System. That's the 10 campuses of the Hawaii System. Uh, that's a public university, and uh, this is JT Ash, HIPAA Compliance Officer. Welcome, brother. How are you doing? <laughs> you got caught up with the court. I know, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, welcome, and uh, let's let's start talking about who you are okay. and then what you do. So who you are, you know, where'd you grow up? How'd you get educated? How'd you get into this business? Okay. Because this is a, kind of a weird business. Crazy right? business. It's a crazy tell, yeah. business. So where'd you start out? Um, I, I always like to say that I'm in chapter four of my professional career. Once again, <laughs> uh, I did 20 years U.S. Navy, retired. I retired as a senior chief IT specialist. So I started on oh. the good side of the world. So I did IT and networking and help desk and all the rest the of that applied stuff. applied technology. Yes, all of that good old stuff. Uh, retired. Uh, and then the old normal thing was to basically go into the federal government. So I did nine, yep, nine years <laughs> in the the federal government, different places such as um, uh, Veterans Administration, Army Intelligence, and I actually worked at a, a data center over at Pearl Harbor, so that was fun. I uh, got a phone call one day uh, where uh, I had a financial institution downtown said they needed a chief information security officer. I said, okay, sure, why not? Uh, what year was that? Um, 2014 was actually when they called, and it was one of those things where I went uh, it was supposed to be an interview, but it, I think three hours later after his wife interrupted us after the phone call going, you're going to come home for dinner type of thing. Uh, I said, well, you know, I'm comfortable where I'm at. It's been fun. Let's go have a beer one time. He was a 49er fan, so I was very happy to, oh, to know nice. the guy. Okay. Uh, and, and then he made me an offer that I couldn't refuse at the time. Oh, how dare he? Yeah. Uh, then uh, I decided to open up my own consulting business, and then I... Uh, I got another phone call. Garrett Yoshimi, the, the, the CIO over at the University of Hawaii, bought me a cup of coffee, which is my total weakness. You buy me a cup of coffee. I, <laughs> I Yeah, I usually uh, give you anything you want. He goes, uh, hey, we're going to start this HIPAA program, and I, I need somebody to start it, run it, and figure it out. So let's talk about, OK, first of all, i got to backtrack. Okay. You're a Niner fan, so you're from yes. the Bay Area. Yes. Right, OK. Yes. Uh, East Bay. Oh. Uh, A's, Raiders, Warriors. I, I like the A's. Bitter rivalry, yes. right? Yeah. So, so the audience knows uh, there's a chance of like people break into fighting over those two teams, right? Very, very much so. <laughs> it's and a I, bitter rivalry. <laughs> just to stay off topic and all that stuff, how do you feel about the Raiders leaving and going to Vegas? You know, good for them. <laughs> yeah, good for them. Let's, let's go to a city that really wants them and just yeah. is going to pay for a great stadium. Uh, I think they're going to put that thing up in like five years. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, I love staying in Vegas. I go yeah. there every year for DEF CON and Black yeah, Hat. So, so. Awesome. awesome. I, I, I like it. What do you think about them going down there? Um, I, I was a really big Raiders fan back in the early 80s when there was Kenny Stabler Art and Dave, Dave Casper LA. and all the rest of those yeah, guys. Yeah. Um, they broke my heart when they went to L.A. And after that, I uh, ran across the bay to the 49ers when they had Jim Plunkett and oh. uh, O.J. Simpson before the days of Joe Montana. You just went where the action was. Uh, I, I, <laughs> hey, uh, once again, uh, when the 49ers went to my home, hometown of Santa Clara, California, and put their business there, and now their stadium's there. I've been to Levi Stadium. Uh, uh, the 49ers are where my heart is. Sounds like you fell in love. I did. <laughs> Joe Montana Hopefully it's going to be beautiful in Vegas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll go to a game I, after you know, we do the conference yeah. or something, and, uh, and we'll hit it up, and we'll yeah. tell our audience, hey, the Raiders are cool. Of Here's course. what it looks like. It, it looks like it's going to be a beautiful stadium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's get back on topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, Garrett Yoshimi uh, hires you for the UH system mm -hmm. uh, to do HIPAA compliance. Yes. Let's talk about... HIPAA, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability mm -hmm. Act. Um, when did it come about? Why is it important? Okay. How's it do anything with cyber? Well, well actually, it came back in the, the mid 1990s, HIPAA came around, mm -hmm. and, and it was for HIPAA insurance portability. So uh, a lot of people think that it's about health information and health information. It kind of morphed because the security rule for the electronic portion of it didn't come around until 2005. Mm. And breach notification, I think it was about a couple of years later, I think 2013. So once again, it was always about the privacy rule from like 1990. 
six or seven to 2005, and it was about um, protecting the rights of the patients to control their information. And if they were going to go from job to job, they were able to take their health insurance for them. So once again, a big thing about HIPAA is about insurance and insurance companies. Okay, so how does that have to do with cyber? Um, okay, so there's three rules when you're talking about HIPAA. There's a okay. privacy rule, there's a security rule, and there's a breach notification. Um, security rule is when you have electronics, and everything nowadays, you don't have paper, you have electronics. Right. So if you're sitting there and looking about cyber, there's uh, certain what we call admin, technical, and uh, physical safeguards that you have to do in the security rule. And once again, with the push for electronic health care and health care records, uh, that seems to have morphed into the more important uh, rule when it comes to HIPAA. Now, the, I, when I read the HIPAA rules, I think mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, my read is, it's almost all access control. Um, I would say yes. Because once again, if you're talking about a privacy, because the privacy rule is actually about access, mm -hmm. consent, authorization. Uh, and once again, if you're looking at that, I, I can understand you don't want people to see your particular health care record or anything like that. But it also has to do with access. Uh, once again, on, on the black market, uh, a uh, uh, social security number is about worth a dime. Uh, a credit card is worth about 25 cents. An electronic health record can be up between $300 and $1,000 per record. And why is so, that? Um, two real reasons for that. Uh, one, uh, heaven forbid you have something that's really embarrassing in your past or whatever it may be. Uh -huh. uh, so, you, yeah, you, you wouldn't want somebody to sit there and say, okay, you, you had a STD or whatever it mm. might be. Right. But, but I think second and most important, and it's, it's what really drives me is, um, Say you were diagnosed with cancer or something like that, and you yeah. were getting ready and you were working with your oncologist to uh, uh, go over your protocol, and they said, hey, we've talked to your insurance company and we can't cover you for this because you've already had this particular coverage, and you know you haven't. So, so once again, the black market for people taking care of benefits and getting benefits, getting medicines and whatever it may be. So consider yourself, if you're sitting there and having to, to fight uh, uh, a uh, terminal illness or whatever it may be, and then actually have to invite an insurance company to get the coverage you need. I mean, to me, that is just overwhelming to sit there and see when you're at your weakest, uh, them taking advantage of you. Now, that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you came aboard as a HIPAA compliance yep. officer for the University of Hawaii. Now let's, let's see how HIPAA relates to the University of Hawaii. Yeah. Um, see, this is where, it's, okay, HIPAA, it pertains to two basic people. You've got to either be a covered entity, covered component underneath our system, or a business associate. So there's two ways you can be, uh, have to get the HIPAA obligations. One by policy okay. and one by contract. By policy, you have to be one of three things. You have to be a healthcare provider, a doctor, a dentist, a nurse, mm. a chiropractor, or right. whatever it may be. But you also have to charge. So once again, if you are a doctor or a dentist and you're not charging through HIPAA, then once again, you'd still have health information, but you wouldn't be covered underneath HIPAA. Same thing for a health plan and a health clearinghouse. Health well, plan that's is- That's interesting now. Uh, so that sparks my mind. Yes. Free clinics? Yes. Don't fall under HIPAA? No, they don't. So that's scary. So people go to free clinics yes. and they do want a confidential mm -hmm. information, but they're not secured through HIPAA. But I, I, I hear you, but, but understand that we also have uh, regulations here at the University of Hawaii, mm -hmm. even though you have state um, privacy laws that will actually cover that. So once again, regardless of if you're covered with HIPAA, there are still um, data protection requirements from the University of Hawaii to protect health information that might not be covered underneath HIPAA. But, but statewide, you're saying there's also protection. So mm -hmm. other than the University yeah. of Hawaii, a free clinic would still be Required to keep those Very much records so. private. Well, thank God. For any forty-seven <laughs> n. There, there, there might be people that don't seek health uh, mm -hmm. treatment mm -hmm. because they think their records might be shared. Yeah. There's a big concern now. I've, I've read, uh, and I'm not going to tell you where because you know we read stuff. Of course. Uh, that a lot, not a lot of other people read, but there, there's a concern out there that um, the health information can be used by businesses to exclude you from things, charge you more for things, or to sell you things. So for instance, if you worked at, uh, I don't know, a construction company or, or a bank, mm -hmm. and uh, the health insurance provider got a hold of all those records, 
for all your employees mm -hmm. while you're negotiating your medical rates. They mm -hmm. can say, well, look, I got, uh, not only do I have all your health records, but I also have Amazon shopping records mm -hmm. that indicates that 25% uh, of your employees that shop on Amazon buy plus size clothing. Mm -hmm. We think you're a diabetes risk. We're not going to sell you mm -hmm. diabetes medic medication. Well, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but, but the, the HIPAA privacy rule does prevent you from sharing it for certain purposes, and I think that would be actually one of those purposes that they, they would either have to have your authorization or consent to do. Uh -huh. so, so once again, just like if you're sitting there and having a Fitbit or whatever it may be, if you're sitting mm -hmm. there and getting a free Fitbit to provide people your medical information, you know, you have to sit there and do the cost-benefit analysis. If this is going to make me healthy, I'm willing to give them my medical information. Now, they can share it for research purposes, but they have to anonymize the data, is that right? Um, there are certain different ways that you can do it. Um, uh, anonymizing, or we call it de-identifying information, which mm -hmm. is basically, it would, we have 18 personal identifiers that we would use in oh, HIPAA. Oh, you know exactly how many uh, there are. I know there, okay. uh, they are, and, and once again, I won't sit there and bore you with the, the numbers, but once again, there's two ways to actually de-identify information uh -huh. and, and to make that uh, uh, available for research. But understand, pe people can use medical information for research if you give them consent to do it. This is basically, if you de-identify information, that's basically, like say if you're going to do a, a research with about a million patients, it might not behoove you to sit there and go and get permission from a million people. So you actually de-identify the information where you don't have to get authorization or consent to actually get the information. But there's still enough information in there to have a good population for a decent study. Of course, yeah. but and no I, person like identifiable. That, actually, um, I'm in favor of that because most of the research that I see, just reading, you know, just health news, mm -hmm. I usually drill down to see what the study was like, and the populations of the studies mm -hmm. are Beneath 10,000 subjects, mm -hmm. always, and I don't think that's a huge population. Mm -hmm. That's enough to justify further research, maybe, from a, a statistical standpoint. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of these research projects were done with, you know, 150 to 2,500 people. That's nothing. Nothing. And so it's good to hear that we can get sample populations of one or two million people mm -hmm. and drill down to gender, race, and and you know other different factors without fishing out that person. Yes. And 18 different things. Can you give us an example of the uh, name? Name, uh, I think email is actually one of them. Oh yeah, uh, well that would be identifiable. The vehicle ID number is one of them. Well sure, you can cross reference. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So oh, that yeah. is actually one of my, I think if you have a URL to a home page or something like that, I think that's another one of them. But name, address, date of birth, all of those particular things. Uh, yeah, so if somebody's health profile was a identifiable like in a study, mm -hmm. but they left in the state, would that be a risk? Because that could help with the research, right? That could help with the research. Uh, study, I, yeah. I think anything below the state is actually uh, unidentifiable. But once again, you have to look at your population. If you only have uh, one under five foot uh, uh, Tongan, then once again, the, 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 the you could easily figure that out what it rare. was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, once again, I'm trying to give you a, 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 an example. Right, right. Um, I, would, I would hope that someday we'd have a way to de-anonymize the data, mm -hmm. de-identify people, uh, so that we could study uh, uh, cities. Uh, for instance, the population in and around Three Mile Island mm -hmm. would be uh, one, or in and around uh, Baton Rouge or, or um, uh, anywhere in Louisiana yeah. that was hit by the hurricane, mm -hmm. or Houston. How about in uh, California when they were sitting there and doing the things with the uh, PG&E? That would be great. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, they got a water sample from the yeah. property, though, and that's what did in PG&E. Yeah. Hopefully, that's not still happening, but something tells me we're still going to deal with that <laughs> in the future. There's just money talks. Yes. Right? Yes, and very, very much so. Money removes morals, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And uh, so let's talk about, good, that's a great thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, money, ethics, HIPAA. Mm -hmm. Connect the dots for us in the uh, academic world. Okay. And, and what you deal with. Um, the wonderful thing about uh, HIPAA at the University of Hawaii is we, we're what is called a hybrid entity, which means that we have like the College of Education, the College of Engineering, they don't have to comply to HIPAA because once again, they don't have to deal with health information. So we actually have designated entities that are actually HIPAA covered and that have to comply with them. Oh, we currently okay. have about 10 of them. So once again, not everybody in the university, uh, Kapilani College, there are certain people over there, but- Oh, uh, we that, have a nursing program. You have a nursing program right. and they might have health 
health information, but they're not charging people for it ah. and putting in insurance claims so they're not covered underneath HIPAA. It's not HIPAA. Yes. Okay, let's talk more about that. Okay. We've got to take a break and pay some bills. We'll okay. be right back. Till then, stay safe. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of New Japanese Language Show on Think Tech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Welcome back to the second half of the show. This is the Cyber Underground. I'm your host, Dave the Cyber Guy. And my ho uh, guest is JT Ash, a HIPAA compliance officer from the UH system or University of Hawaii system. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about uh, connected dots, uh, money, HIPAA compliance, mm -hmm. uh, let's add management to yes. the mix. Yes. And uh, so you were talking about the, of all the entities that are in your hybrid organization, mm -hmm. uh, certain ones do not fall under HIPAA compliance. Right, so let's talk about the ones that do and how okay. you handle that. Um, well, uh, we, we actually have a program, we actually have unit HIPAA coordinators that we work with. Uh, we work with them to make sure that they have all of the compliance issues in place. Uh, we've actually gone out and bought them templates to work on their policies and procedures and, and, and try to provide as much support that we've had. We've visited every nook and cranny so far in the first year I've been here. Uh. And, and once again, when we go out to the different clinics, um, the first day, we don't even talk about HIPAA. We don't even talk about IT. We talk about business processes. We talk about when a new student comes in to get checked out by you, what information do you take from them? How do you take the information? Where do you put it? Where do you process it? Where well, do you store it? Well, that's critical. In yes. any security organization, yes. it's not the encryption. It's yes. not the VPN. It's the process yes. by where you employed it, yes. which might have cracks in the armor, mm -hmm. right? You want to look for those kinks in the armor. So the first thing you're going to do is, how do you do business? Yeah. So that's a good thing. You're yeah. going out there. Just show me how you do yep. things, right? Very, yeah. very much so. And, and once again, it's actually had a, a, a good effect on, we sit there and we look at business processes and we actually go, hmm, maybe we should do this a little better, faster, or whatever it may be. So we've actually had some second order of effects out of that that have been pretty good. Well, that's a that's a great yeah. secondary effect, yeah. right? That's a, a side effect of more efficiency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good on you. But that's, that's one of the things where you're sitting there and, and, and HIPAA is it, it, and IT and business, they all have to work together. Once again, uh, we're all here because we're trying to educate a population and, and do that. So once again, that's the business and the mission that we have here. So that's a tough one, isn't it? Um, trying to get those siloed organizations to mm -hmm. work across boundaries and to play as a team. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any difficulties with that? Um, it, it, it's, it's trying to um, have a conversation with those entities and have them understand that we're here to help them, whether it's IT, whether it's cyber. So once again, uh, IT and cyber risk is business risk, and it's all about the business and, and how they are supposed to do uh, uh, work. So once again, the IT will hopefully make their lives a little easier. Once again, cyber will make that a little more secure. So once again, you're working all together as a team to where um, business have different objectives in cyber. It's, it's always going to be a, a fight because once again, if you sit there and put more stringent controls on it, it's going to be more difficult for the business. And there's got to be a... There's a balance. Yes, yeah, achieve, there's got to yeah. be a balance. But it's all about the risk, right? What's yes. the acceptable level of yes. risk? You've got laws to comply with, and then after that, you've got other risks that you have to mitigate, yeah. and just stuff happens yeah. all the time. You have to adjust your scope based on to the current affairs, current mm -hmm. political climate, what kind of a target yeah. your, your institution is, right? Uh, that's one of the things I tell my students frequently is, I'm, you know, when you're building a security plan, mm -hmm. be sure you're aware of current events. Mm -hmm. You are in current events whether you like it or not, and yeah. the bigger your organization is, the bigger footprint you have in current events. Um, if you're a bank, North Korea is a concern, right? Mm -hmm. Because every time we put another sanction on them, they need money. What do they do? They go out, they hack the banks. They got the SWIFT system. Yep. And they got, what, $80 million before we shut them down. I 
I think it was more than that. Was it really? Yeah, I think it was about 270 million. Oh my. Yeah. Before someone said, yeah. hmm, that's odd. Yep, yep, uh, oh, yep, uh, I understand. So you gotta be you aware, so yeah. as an academic institution, you have a, you know, um, a, a, a risk model based mm -hmm. on a threat modeling that you did and what's, what's our risk analysis, mm -hmm. right? But uh, when, you, when you put all these pieces together, that's how you sell it, isn't it? We've got a certain amount of risk, we have to mitigate it, but we can't slow you down. Very, very much so. And, and the big thing that I always like to stress is uh, we have to get beyond fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Now, can you? I, I believe you can. <laughs> really? I definitely believe you can. That's a noble goal. Well, well <laughs> let, let, let me t ask you a question. Have you heard of this before? Um, you go walking in the woods with a bunch of friends and you come on a bear. You just got to be faster than the guy next to you, right? And, and I've heard that before. I've actually used that before. But when you sit there and you actually break that down, that's a bear fallacy. Because once again, if you come upon a bear, if I come upon a bear in the woods, I want to be scared. And so once again, I'm going to be fearful and all that stuff. If I only have to be faster than the slowest person with me, yeah. that's under the impression that I think we're going to be all running in the same direction. <laughs> or, or the bear might not be hungry or whatever it may be. There's only so many things there. There's so many uncertainties and doubts that you have. But if you get beyond that and actually can provide the business folks with a business-related money, dollars and cents, uh, uh, risk assessment, a quantitative risk assessment, I think you can get past the, the, the fear, uncertainty, doubt. And I think the business people are ready to have that conversation. So let's talk about quantitative versus qualitative yeah. data. And, uh, there's audience members here in the cheap seats, so let's explain. Quantitative is numbers. Yep. You solid numbers that you gather. This is actual data that yep. you can uh, analyze. You can you can crunch the numbers. You mm -hmm. can come up with statistical models, right? Mm -hmm. Qualitative, a little bit fuzzier. Mm -hmm. It's opinions. It's the feelings mm -hmm. of of the crowd. But you have to combine the two somehow into a reasonable model to assess the current situation, right? Mm -hmm. So when you go out and you say you need quantitative data, what kind of numbers do you gather and do you gather qualitative data as well? Um, I think there's always going to be qualitative in, in, in involved, but uh, what I can tell you this, and that's probably another show that we need to have about <laughs> quantitative risk assessments. Okay. What I can tell you is that if you're, not go if you're going to go into a boardroom, if you're going to go into the Board of Regents or whatever it may be, if you don't talk to them about dollars and cents, if you start talking to them about threats and vulnerabilities, they're not going to hear you. If you sit there and you tell them, hey, this particular application supports this particular business process. This process brings us $250,000 a month. If we actually put in this control, which is about $20,000 a year, we will reduce the risk 78%. If you can sit there and have that conversation with them, fear, uncertainty, and doubt go out the window. They stick to the numbers. Yes. Stick to the numbers because, once again, when you walk into that boardroom, when you walk into those people who actually control the risk, control, own the risk, you usually can get what you need. And you use a lot of pictures and graphics because I, I know the board members I talk to, you know, you know, three seconds in there, they, you know, they're like, squirrel. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. De definitely. <laughs> I've, I've had those people. But once again, when you start saying, hey, you have a million dollar exposure by having this out here, uh, ears perk up. And, right. and once again, when you sit there and, you know, I've had it both ways when you go, okay, we just got a finding on an audit, and the audit co committee is really upset about it. But when you actually sit there and break it down to numbers, this is only actually a $20,000 exposure. Oh, we have a cybersecurity insurance plan worth $50,000. You good with accepting it kind of thing? Uh, it's bean counting at that point. Yeah. It's always bean counting. Yeah. Everything's about bean counting. You know that. Well, let's, let's talk about this. Is, this has been your first year, yeah. right? So I know organizations out there that have to be HIPAA compliant mm -hmm. or SOX compliant or they have to do a PCI mm -hmm. compliance or they have to do a NIST yeah. or something like that. When you go out, say next year, yep. you're going to have to audit yourself. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to perform an organizational analysis to see, did I do my job? Are there gaps? Mm -hmm. uh, how do I fill my gaps? And when I fill my gaps, when am I going to pay for that filling yeah. of the gap? Yeah. Right? Is it in this month's budget or is it next quarter? Yeah. And when can I buy that firewall that I've needed for so Very long? So. Um, how, how, first of all, how do you do the audit? Uh -huh. Um, actually, the Health and Human Services and the Office of Civil Rights actually provides you an audit. So once again, you can actually uh, 
read to the test type of thing. Get out of here. That's my uh, tax dollars at work? Hey, it actually works really, really good. But if you Good job, there, Hawaii. Yeah. Good if, job. <laughs> if you sit there and you think about it, we're actually going through an annual report for the first time, and we're going to actually pr provide this to the uh, Council of Chancellors. And we're going to sit there and have a conversation with different stuff like UH policy, where we're exactly at the, with the UH policy, how we are on our self-assessments and where we think we are in that particular process, how our uh, corrective action plans are, how many incidents or breaches that we have. So once again, having that conversation to make the upper management aware that this is actually a, a, an issue here at the university. Now, you've brought up some interesting statistics that you brought to that conversation, right? How many breaches we've had and so forth. So you do need to talk with IT and the cyber guys of course. to find out what they're IDS, IPS log say, mm -hmm. and uh, you need some uh, log analysis, yes. you need some data analytics, and all that doesn't come cheap. Uh, all that doesn't come cheap, and actually that's one of the most expensive things that people have a hard time with because it is so expensive. But once again, uh, uh, just like the NIST cyber framework, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, it's kind of like a rolling uh, 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 framework. First you have to identify then you have to put the protections in. If you don't have any detections, once again, having zero breaches for a year doesn't mean that you're actually right. doing you, your job. Looking. <laughs> I, I've actually had conversations with health and human service auditors, yeah. and they love the conversation. Oh, we haven't had a breach in three years. And their first question is, how do, how do you, you know? know? How do you know? <laughs> and, and, and the look on most people's faces, oh, oh, I good don't question. And, and then they start having this conversation with, yeah. Has anybody ever emailed a, a record to the wrong person? Has anybody oh. faxed a, a, a record to the wrong person? Has anybody, uh, can, can you show me your firewall logs to see if you had any intrusions that you're concerned about? Now this happens in software development all the time because I was in software development for 20 years mm -hmm. and in, even in the most secure situations, there's always someone that says from another vendor, hey, via email, mm -hmm. I need some sample data. Sure, here's a spreadsheet of some sample mm -hmm. and it's, Real people and real information, and we just sent it open over the email, and then you have to have the conversation. And you know, it's not encrypted, it's not yeah. secured, it's over, you know, port, you know, whatever you're sending over the, through the firewall, but it's open. Yeah. And, and we're not encrypting or securing that email. And SMTP 4, 425, probably. Uh, is that the one that's, that's not, that's encrypted? SMTP? Is it? Oh, okay, um, sure. I don't know my ports and protocols. Okay. You just caught me. Yeah, sorry. I, I need to go back and review. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, shoot, yeah. And so, but that, that actually goes into the framework that you're talking about. Once again, once you have the detection, breaches are going to happen. And once again, you have to understand and you have to accept that particular fact that somebody's going to, you know, I, I believe that everybody goes to work every day wanting to do the right things. Sure. But as long as you have people, and you know, as long as you have processes, mistakes are going to happen. Well, you just have human. To, yeah, <laughs> you just have to have processes in place, such as, okay, if I do this, what is my response? Who do I need to contact? What do I need to do? Uh, is it like above 500 records? Because if it's above 500 records, then you're a HIPAA oh, person. Oh, it sounds like you have to make this whole plan. You, there is an incident <laughs> response plan, and that's actually one of the safeguards that you have to put in place. But once again, if you have the detection in place, and you have the response in place, and you have your disaster recovery, you can actually follow the book. Yes. What a novel concept. This has been a great episode. Yeah. Thanks for coming. We're out of time. And, sir, I hope to see you back. Let's have those episodes you say we I need to do. I would love to have on that. episodes about quantitative risk assessments. It's one of my favorite topics. How about incident response? That's another That'd one. That would be I fantastic. Love that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're a great guest. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this is Cyber Underground. We'll be back next week with another great episode. Until then, stay safe.